Numbers chapter 21. The nation of Israel is very close to entering into the promised land. And what they're doing is they're coming around onto the other side of the promised land. And they're going to eventually cross the Jordan and then enter into the land. And you remember Jericho is the first city that they will eventually conquer. But they're coming up from behind or, I guess, beneath. And then they're coming in from the side. But they've got some issues to deal with on the way. It says in verse 1 that when the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. And the word Hormah actually means destruction. So from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. Now, this was probably very frustrating to get. Do you know how it feels to get so close to a particular goal that you have in mind and then to feel like you're going back the way you came? That's got to be very, very frustrating. But the reason they were trying to bypass Edom was because they were told, you know, they weren't to mess with the people of Edom. And, um, and, and, uh, they, they, and e the Edomites did not want them going through their land, so they had to turn around and go back on the road that they were coming from, which they call the way to the Red Sea. Now, they're obviously not going to the Red Sea, but they're on that road, right? And this must have been just tremendously frustrating, and I think the people felt that way. Unfortunately, they gave in to their frustration. And it says in verse 5 that the people spoke against God, and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Well, and they kind of stepped over the line right there. It says, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He uh, take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Stop there for just a minute. <laughs> I know, crazy story, even a little bit weird, right? There are some things about this passage that are pretty typical we've seen before, and that's the murmuring aspect. We've, you know, that's predictable. God's judgment is particularly interesting related to this murmuring, sending these what is called fiery serpents, no doubt referring to what the venom perhaps produced in someone who had been bit, I'm imagining. And... Um, the solution was even more crazy, and that is God telling Moses to fashion a bronze image of a serpent and then set it up on a pole for everybody to look at. And God told Moses to tell the people that when anybody is bitten by one of these snakes, notice he didn't take the snakes away. <laughs> Seems like that would have been a fairly easy solution. But instead of taking the snakes away, they continued to be there. But if anyone got bit, they were to look at this bronze serpent hanging on this pole, and they would be saved from death. Um, I you got to admit, it's just a little bit strange. It's just it's kind of a little bit weird. So the question kind of naturally arises: What is so special about this bronze serpent? that by looking at it after someone's been bit, that it would, it would save them from that very deadly snake bite? And the answer is nothing. There was nothing special about that bronze serpent. It was an image, a, a metal image fashioned 
in the shape of this, these serpents and put up on a pole. And so you're saying, well, then what's the deal here anyway? People, this is a test of faith, and it's nothing less. The people were told, if they were bitten, to look upon this serpent up on the, the pole, and they would be healed and not suffer any ill effects. But the key to their being healed is they had to believe it. They had to believe they would be healed. See, they'd been told. Moses told them, here's what God says to you. If you're bit by one of these snakes, I want you to go right to this area in the camp where this pole is set with this serpent up on it, and I want you to look at it. And when you look at it, you're going to be healed. You're not going to suffer ill effects from that snake bite. <laughs> Guys, this is an exercise of faith. And God is preparing His people to walk by faith and to understand salvation by faith. You guys understand that this, this picture of this bronze serpent is so similar to what we are called to do related to the idea of looking upon Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins, that this is actually used in the New Testament by Jesus as a, a symbolic pointer to what we share in our faith in Christ. Let me show you a passage from, on the screen from John chapter 3. It goes like this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. Listen, what the people of Israel were being told to do was to believe in the promise of God. And yeah, it surrounded a, a, a bronze serpent on a pole. A little bit weird, I know. I always kind of thought, couldn't you have come up with something else? But you know, those were the things that were, you know, this was the cause of their issue, right? And so, you know, what are they told to do? They're told to put their faith in God's promise. So perfectly attuned to what we do in Jesus Christ that you can see Jesus even made a connection. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That all who believe, all who look upon Him, we look upon Jesus in a very real sense as well as the people looked upon this bronze serpent. By the way, bronze is the metal of sin. Don't ever forget that either. Um, it, it, it's, there are many connections with the, the, the metal of bronze in the Scripture, and it's always keyed to the idea of sin, but uh, that, that's why the, the snake was made out of bronze. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 10, and the people of Israel set out and camped in Oboth, and they set out from Oboth and camped at Liabarim in the wilderness that is opposite Moab toward the sunrise. From there they set out and camped in the valley of Zered. From there they set out and camped on the other side of the Arnon, which is in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, obviously something we don't possess at all today, uh, Waheb in the Sufa and the valleys of the Arnon and the slope of the valleys that extends to the seat of Ar and leans to the border of Moab. And from there, they continued to Ba'er. That is the well of which the Lord said to Moses, Gather the people together so that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing to it. The well that the princes made and the nobles of the people dug with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the wilderness that went on to Matanah, and from Matanah to Nahaliel, and from Nehaliel to Bemoth, and from Bemoth to the valley lying in the region of Moab by the top of Pisgah that looks down on the desert. Pisgah was obviously a, a, a raised area. Um, <clears throat> in fact, it's just a few miles northeast of the, or east rather, of the northeast edge of the Dead Sea. Let me show you. I've got a map actually that I want to show you of this area so you can kind of get a sense. Now, Israel is over here on the other side 
of, you know, the, the Salt Sea, but you can see where the nation of Israel basically is now, this area of this, this Pisgah, which, you know, is about 5,000, well, close to 6,000 feet. Um, and it says from up there, you can see the whole valley. And so this is the, they're obviously not up on top of the Pisgah, they're, they're in that region around it. And so there's this, this kind of this, this huge area, landmass, that they're taking a look at. And eventually, Israel is going to move their way, you know, uh, across the Jordan, and they're going to make their way into the Promised Land. They're not there yet, but where they are right now is very significant because it is from here that the king of Moab is going to present a challenge uh, here to Israel in the coming chapters, and we'll get into that. Let's run through the rest of this chapter quickly. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into field or vineyard. We will not drink the water of a well. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. But Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. He gathered all his people together and went out against Israel to the wilderness and came to Yahaz and fought against Israel. Talk about picking a fight that you can't win. I mean, this guy, they're willing to pass through this guy's land and leave it alone. But, of course, he's afraid. Fear will do weird things to you. And, in fact, it's not the last time we'll read about it. And it says in verse 24, And Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land. It was from the Arnon to the Jabbok, as far as to the Ammonites, to the border of the Ammonites, or excuse me, for the border of the Ammonites was strong. And this was a very large area. Let me show you again. I'll, we'll put the map up here. And, and, and this box just basically kind of covers the area where this king ruled, that was his kingdom. And this was not meant to be part of God's promised land. This was not part of the promised land. But they conquered it, and it will eventually be the home of the tribe of Gad and Reuben. They're going to ask to stay there um, after they go into the land to help their brothers uh, clear the land of the Canaanites. They're going to ask if their families then can stay there, if they can come back then and, and, uh, and, and remain in the land. So anyway, you kind of get a little sense there, uh, picture-wise, of where we're talking, all right? Verse 25, And Israel took all these cities, and Israel settled in all the cities of the Amorites in Heshbon, and all, in all its villages. For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, uh, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand as far as the Arnon. Therefore the ballad singers, your Bible may say poets, say, come to Heshbon, let it be built, let the city of Sihon be established, for fire came out from Heshbon, flame from the city of Sihon, it devoured Ar of Moab and swallowed the heights of the Arnon, Woe to you, O Moab! You are undone, O people of Chemosh. He has made his sons fugitives and his daughters captives to an Amorite king, Sihon. So we overthrew them. Heshbon, as far as Debon, perished, and we laid waste as far as Nophah. Fire spread as far as Madiba. Cool. Apparently that was a song. It was a, it was a hit, I'm sure top 40 and everything like that. Thus Israel lived in the land of the Amorites. And Moses sent to spy out Yazir. And they captured its villages and dispossessed the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up by the way to Bashan. Now this is, this is still north. If you think about that map that I just showed you and that red box, now they're moving even farther north, okay, which is the land of Bashan. And it says, And Og, king of Bashan, came out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. But the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand, and all his people and his land. And you shall do to him as you did to Sichon, king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon. So they defeated him and his sons and all his people until he had no survivor left, and they possessed his land. So now Israel, as you can see, is living in this vast area on the wrong side of the Jordan. Again, this is land that God did not intend to give His people. This was not part of the original promised land. And yet, Israel has conquered these nations because these nations basically came out and tried to fight against Israel. 
And so now they're living there, at least for the time being. And as I said, uh, two and a half of the tribes of Israel will eventually stay there, all right, on the other side of the Jordan. All right, Numbers chapter 22. This is where it gets interesting. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. Did you catch that? Again, this is another interesting situation. I mean, in one sense, Balak's fear is understandable because the nation of Israel has already conquered these other nations there on the other side of the Jordan. So his fear, I suppose, is well-placed. But what's interesting, or what he didn't know, is that God had actually commanded the Israelites to leave Moab alone. Don't touch them, right? So God had no intention of you know, giving the land of Moab to Israel. And if he just, you know, of course, if the guy would have known that, probably wouldn't have been so fearful. But did you notice that the last thing it says here is that he was overcome? In fact, the whole nation was overcome with fear. And you know, when you're overcome with fear, you do stupid things, don't you? You do dumb things. You do things you wouldn't do otherwise. There you go. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, this horde... Is now will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Emmah, to call him, saying, Behold, the people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Stop there for just a minute. We are introduced to the main character of these next three chapters. Balaam, who appears out of nowhere. We've never heard of him before. And what we learn of him is that he has a gift of prophecy, although he's mixed with some weird pagan kind of influences and divining and that sort of thing, sorcery. And we don't know, well, we, we get into the story and we find out that he has an understanding of Israel's covenant God. He even refers to Israel's covenant God by his covenant name, Yahweh. How Balaam came to know Yahweh by name as, you know, the God and to make him his own God, which he claims in this passage, you'll see, we don't know. We don't have any idea. What we do know is that Balak knew who he was and respected him for his power. You'll notice Balak said to him, I know that those whom you bless are blessed and those whom you curse are cursed. So Balaam is considered a powerful man. Verse 7. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, you see we've got kind of two, really two nations going on here, the Midianites and the Moabites, departed with the fees for divination. You'll notice that they brought a some money with them. Apparently, that was a common payment for such services uh, in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. And by the way, the word Lord is Yahweh. All right? So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Now, did you notice here that you know, they brought him the fees for divination. What is divination? Let me show you the definition on the screen here of divination. Basically means the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural means. Synonyms would be fortune telling or divining. All right? And in Balak's case, he believed that divination could also produce a curse. Uh, on his enemy. So, 
Balaam says, stay here for the night. I'll talk to God and give you my answer in the morning. Um, verse 9, and God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, I want you to notice this answer, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Does that sound clear to you as far as a response from God? It sounds pretty clear to me. God says, you shall not go. You shall not curse them. They are a blessed people. So should be, uh, the situation should be done, right? We should be just, that should be the end of the chapter, and then we move on. Not so much. Verse 13. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go to your own land, for the Lord has, has refused to let me go with you. I want you to think about that response for just a minute because you can almost hear Balaam's heart in it as if he was kind of saying, I really would like to go with you, but I can't. God's not letting me. So, aw shucks, I guess I can't go. There you are. Almost like asking him to ask again. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I will do. Boy, when your king says that to you, that means something. Come curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Notice that. The Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Now that's an interesting response, isn't it? Instead of saying, guys, you were here just a few days ago. You brought the same request. I told you. I told the first guys that came. God you know, said no. He said no. So, goodbye, you know? But notice what Balaam says at the very end. He goes, yeah, well, you know, I, I told your first guys that came that even if the king gave me a whole house full of silver and gold, I can't come with you guys, so tell you what, stick around, I'll see what else God says. And you can kind of hear what's going on here. He's entertaining this thing, and he, re he, he wants to see maybe possibly God might change his mind on this thing, and who knows, I can still get rich. Verse 20, and God came to Balaam at night and said, if the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning, probably delighted, and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way of his adversary. Notice that God is calling Balaam an adversary. Now, he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now, stop there for just a moment. You might be wondering here, why does God get angry at Balaam when he clearly told Balaam the second time around, okay, go with them. If they've come to take you, then go with them. But only say what I tell you to say. Why is God getting angry? Didn't he tell Balaam to go? Yes, he did. But remember, only after Balaam demonstrated a very clear desire to go, in other words, Balaam wanted to disobey God. He wanted very much to disobey God. So God is letting him. God is letting him disobey. Christians, you need to be very clear in your understanding of what this is revealing to you and I about the nature of God as it relates to our obedience or our disobedience. God gives us very clear things in his word. I had a gal email me, and she's not from our fellowship, but saw our teachings online, emailed me and said, I know what God's word has says about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers, but let me tell you a little bit about my boyfriend, and we're not proceeded to tell me about her boyfriend. She's a believer. He's not. I know what God says, but 
and then he just kind of explained the situation. And I was kind of a little bit taken aback because she told me at the very first part of her note, I know what God says, but what do you think? So I wrote her back, and I just simply said, okay, and I actually put the passage in there about not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. I quoted it in my response, and I said, all right, you write me back and tell me what you, see, what you think this passage is telling you about your boyfriend. She wrote back and said, telling me not to be yoked with him. God has spoken, <laughs> right? When we, when we look for another answer, when we look for another response, when we look for further information, and you know, and I have to say, when she wrote back, she was very humble and very responsive, and, and it, was, it was beautiful, actually. She wrote back and said, you know, you're right. It was like kind of a thing like, yeah, I, I, I see. Okay. It, you know, I think she just kind of maybe needed somebody else just to say, okay, this is what God's Word says. Are you, are you, are you going to do it? Or are you going to look for a loophole? Because sometimes, you know, we do that. We, we look in God's Word, and then we look for a loophole. But is that what God really means when He says that? Or is He just kind of saying, in a general sort of a way, no, this is very specific. God told Balaam in no uncertain terms, do not go. Do not curse them. They are blessed. And Balaam looked for a loophole by going to God a second time. And so what did God do? He said, fine, go. But you know what? You are now in opposition to God. And at this particular point onward, we are in an adversarial role with one another because you have chosen to ignore the clear revelation of God's Word. And Christians, this happens in our lives sometimes too. When we ignore the Word of God, we throw it behind us, and we say, yeah, but there's got to be a loophole. And we begin to proceed on even knowing that God has made a clear and direct sort of, you know, understanding uh, for us in His Word. So how does it go for Balaam here? Look what it says in verse 23. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, <laughs> wow, standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Well, you know, it's a sad commentary when a dumb animal has more spiritual insight than a human being, isn't it? In this particular case. And this man is truly gifted on, on a spiritual level. He's not using it for good, necessarily. But, uh, yeah. Verse 28. This, this is the part that gets really kind of weird. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And you can see here in his response just how filled with rage he is over this situation. Because, first of all, guys, listen. He knows he's doing wrong. He knows it. And when we are doing wrong and things begin to fall apart on us along the way, it just, it just builds up anger and resentment because we know we're not doing what we ought to be doing. We know it. And we're, we're coming up against all these things and Balaam doesn't even realize his donkey is talking, for heaven's sakes. You know? And he just, he just he, he, he's filled with such fury, he talks back to the animal. And says, you've made a fool of me. And that's pride, by the way. And if I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you where you sit. Right? And the donkey, notice, notice here. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And all Balaam can say is, no. 
which is kind of interesting. Isn't that interesting that God can even cause a donkey to speak in such a way that he removes the arguments that Balaam might otherwise give? Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. How do you like that? God even says, your donkey just saved your life and you beat her for it. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And we look at that and we go, if? If it is evil? Seriously? He's still playing games with God? Have you ever had somebody say that to you when they're apologizing? Doesn't it, doesn't it remove the whole apology? If I've hurt you, I'm sorry. When they know that you're clearly hurt or they wouldn't probably be apologizing. But what we do when we say that is, we're kind of removing, or oh, we're not removing, what we're doing is we're basically saying, your anger is unjustified, or your hurt is unjustified, right? I see that you're hurt, but I think you're really ridiculous for being hurt. And so, okay, well, if I've hurt you, then I'm sorry, which is, sounds so sincere. But again, it's a statement we make to describe my own self-justification. And, and here again, Balaam is fishing around for permission to still go. So if, you know, if, this is, if, they, if, they, if I'm doing anything wrong here, Lord, I'll turn back, you know. Even though God had made it crystal clear originally and now in this appearance of this angel of the Lord that this is not His will. Do you know this very attitude? is one that Peter wrote about many, many years later. Let me show you this passage on the screen from 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning of verse 15. It says, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Peter calls what moved and motivated Balaam madness. But do you notice here in this passage, Peter talks about Balaam's love of gain, right? He loved gain from wrongdoing. And that's what's going on here, you guys. Make no mistake about it. Peter is, is serving as Holy Spirit-inspired commentary of numbers and telling you and I that what drove Balaam on to defy the Lord, even though God had given him very clear instruction, don't go, don't curse, and then appearing to him in the form of this, the angel of the Lord with drawn sword. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't have hightailed at home and hidden under the bed? for like a month. And yet this man is like, well, if I if you know, if if this is a problem, I can, I, I can still I can go home if if you really want me to. Like I'm baiting you, you know, to let me go. What was driving him? Peter tells us that love of gain. That love of gain. Verse 35. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, "Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you." So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab on the border formed by the Arnon at the extremity of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send to you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? In other words, you know, do I lack the means to make you a wealthy man? And Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. And then Balaam went to Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzoth. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. 
And in the morning, Balak told, uh, took Balaam and brought him up to Bemoth Baal. And from there he saw a fraction of the people, referring to a very small visual part of the nation of Israel from where they were on some sort of a hill, I imagine. Numbers 23. And Balaam said to Balak, Build for me here seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and Balak and Balaam offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height, and God met Balaam. And Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering. And Balaam took up his discourse and said, From Aram Balak has brought me, the king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him. From the hills I behold him. Behold, a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. That's from the Lord spoken through Balaam. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And Balak said to him, Please come, to, uh, come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only a fraction of them and shall not see them all. Then curse them for me from there. By the way, stop there for a moment. The idea of taking Balaam to a second location is very much rooted in pagan thought and practice. They believed, because they believed in a multiplicity of gods, they believed different gods had different authority in different places. They believed there were gods of the valleys, gods of the mountains, gods of the rivers, gods of the oceans, you name it. Gods had different geographic areas where they could exercise their authority better than in others. So by taking Balaam to another mount to see the people below, the chances Balak figured, as a good pagan, he figured, well, there's a chance that, you know, we might enter into a little bit different domain. And maybe this God that Balaam spoke by the first time won't be authoritative here. And I can get him to say what I want because this is the domain of a different God. That's the way Balak would have thought as a, as a dyed-in-the-wool pagan. All right. Verse 14, And he took him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah. You remember I showed you that. And built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, same as the before, Stand here beside your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Return to Balak and thus shall you speak. Here we go. Number two, and he came to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering and with the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? And Balaam took up his discourse and said, Rise, Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless he has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. He is, has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt and is for them like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no enchantment against Jacob, no division, uh, divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what has God wrought? Behold a people. As a lioness, it rises up, and as a lion, it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. And Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all and do not bless them at all. <laughs> He's getting frustrated. 
But Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you that all that the Lord says that I must do? And Balak said to Balaam, Come now, I will take you to another place. <sighs> Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them from there for me. And so Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the desert. And Balaam said to Balak, Build for me here seven altars and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. 24. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. Stop there for just a moment. This is a very interesting note because it's telling you and I, as in this kind of prologue to this third word of the Lord uh, to Balak, that Balaam, up to this point, had been attempting to use divination to kind of, uh, which is, you know, sorcery, as I said before, to kind of conjure up a curse uh, for the people of Israel. But God overthrew him basically every time and made him speak a word of blessing instead of a curse. So he'd been using his own forms of sorcery and divination to make this thing happen. That was his heart, right? But you can see now Balaam is getting the message. Balak, he still, is, he wants to try one more time. But Balaam realizes this God of the Jews is not going to be had. And so he realizes, you know what, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I use my omens, my sorcery, my divination. God is not going to be manipulated into saying something that he doesn't want said. And so what does it say here? It says that instead of doing those things, he simply set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And it says, the Spirit of God came upon him. That's an important distinction now. The Spirit of God did not come upon him in the previous two words. He was given a word through his own means of omen, sorcery, divination. Now it says the Spirit of God comes upon him. This is what we know in the New Testament as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And this is a common Old Testament and New Testament reference to the Spirit coming to empower someone to give a word. Now, it doesn't mean this person is a godly person. Remember that even in, elsewhere in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon Saul, king of Israel, when he was out hunting for David to kill him. And God came upon him and he began to prophesy, and that basically thwarted his whole desire to kill David, right? Because this God's Spirit came upon him. So God's Spirit will do this. The person doesn't have to be saved or, or godly or, or righteous. So don't, don't think that just because the Spirit comes upon Balaam that he is any of those things. And it says in verse 3, And he took up his discourse and said, and by the way, what you're going to hear is some of the most beautiful prophecies about Israel that you will ever hear out of a man who was an enemy of God. And this is amazing. The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eye is opened. The oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. Like palm groves they stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you. Do you guys remember those words? Those words were spoken to Abraham when God called him, when he was still Abram, out of the land of his fathers and said, go to a land about which I will lead you and tell you, and there I will give this land 
to your descendants after you. And then you know what God said to Abram? I'm going to make you into a great nation. And those who curse you, I will curse. And those who bless you, I will bless. And that is a word upon the nation of Israel that we respect to this day. To this day. Because there's nothing to say that God's word in any way has expired as it relates to this particular statement. Um, let me show it to you here on the screen from Genesis 12, 3, just so you can have a sense of seeing where it's located. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you can see the heart of the Lord uh, that has spoken to Abram and now is speaking through Balaam. And Balaam's or excuse me, Balak's anger, verse 10, was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. Therefore, now flee to your own place. I said, I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. In other words, I'm not paying you a red cent. And Balaam said to Balak, did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. And now behold, I am going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with His eyes uncovered. And then look at verse 17. I believe this is the most powerful prophecy in the entire thing. I see Him, but not now. I behold Him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. And, you know, people, without a doubt, this is an incredible passage. The prophecy of a star and a scepter, which speaks of royalty, rising out of Jacob is very specific language referring to the coming messianic ruler. And, you know, obviously we know that person to be our Lord Jesus Christ. This is an amazing prophecy in light of the fact that it comes through Balaam. Balaam, one of the most powerful prophecies of Messiah, comes through this enemy who had his eyes opened to see. Verse 18, he goes on, Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. And that prophecy there was partially fulfilled by King David. Then he looked on Amalek and took up his discourse and said, Amalek was the first among the nations, but its end is utter destruction. So Balaam prophesies the complete and total annihilation of the Amalekites. And he looked on the Kenite, and he took up his discourse and said, Enduring is your dwelling place, and your nest is set in the rock, Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned when Asher takes you away captive. So what he's prophesying here is that the Kenites would gradually diminish in number until they are eventually taken captive by the Assyrian army. Asher is a reference to the Assyrian Empire, all right? Not the tribe Asher, uh, which has a different spelling. And he took up his discourse and said to him, or excuse me, and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from Kittim, and shall afflict Asher and Eber, and he too shall come to utter destruction. And this is a prophecy saying that even the mighty Assyrians, along with the sons of Eber, would come to their own eventual destruction. We know that the, the Assyrian army, uh, empire, was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar conquered it from uh, the kingdom of Babylon. So this is a prophecy long before that, that that would in fact take place. Uh, verse 25 says, 
then Balaam rose and went back to his place, and Balak also went his way, and so forth and so on. Now, the one I want to end with here uh, tonight is with giving you some scriptures that, because there's other references in the Bible to Balaam, and he is spoken of, he's referenced. I've already shown you one that Peter gave us, but I want to show you some others. First of all, from the Old Testament, here's one from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 23. It says, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. We've actually read this before, because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. This passage reminds us that Balaam desired to curse the people. And that's what he did the first two times using his own divining sorcery methods. But what does it say here? God turned the curse into a blessing. Then from Joshua chapter 24, then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel, reminding them of the very things we just read. Nehemiah, from the book of Nehemiah. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. Notice how many times God repeats this over the course of the Word to remind His people. Micah chapter 6, verse 5. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shatim in Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Again, calling to their remembrance. Now we go to the New Testament for a couple of passages. Jude has an interesting statement. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves to the sake of gain, or for the sake of gain, to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. We just read about Korah's rebellion recently. He's the guy who rose up against Moses and Aaron and the ground opened up and he fell in and covered him up. Notice these three things. The way of Cain, the sake of gain of, to Balaam's error, and Korah's rebellion. Jude speaks of people who enter those same attitudes and endings. Then from, in the letter to the church in Pergamum, in Revelation chapter 2, it says this, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. And you read this and you go, what is this? We didn't read about this yet in Numbers. What's, what's all this about? It says in Revelation. I have, some, I have something against you. you got some people in your church who hold to this teaching of Balaam who taught the Moabites, right, how to put a stumbling block in front of Israel. Guys, we're going to read about this next week. Suddenly, But it's not going to mention Balaam. We don't find out about this until we get to Revelation. But here we find out in the next couple, a few chapters, that what Balaam said to the king of Moab is, listen, if you're, if you're going to try to curse him with curses, it's never going to work. The only way you can possibly destroy these people is to weaken them with sin. And then their God will turn against them. And so what Balak did is he sent some very pretty, scantily clad women coming down the hill. And he enticed the men of Israel to enter into pagan worship practices sexually charged with these women, and sure enough, judgment came upon Israel right there. But that's what we find out in the book of Revelation. You've got to get to the end of the Bible 
to find out what Balaam did to try to get his money. And I'm willing to bet when he came to Balak at, at this point, he said to him, listen, I have some information for you, and it's worth something. It's worth everything you promised to me before. And so I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to tell you how you can defeat these people. And I'll bet you Balaam got his money. But you know what? It didn't last him very long at all. You want to know how Balaam ended? It's the last verse we look at here. And we go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua, chapter 13. It says, Balaam also, the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. And that's talking about when God wiped out that area through his people. Balaam died. He probably got his money from Balak. He never got a chance to enjoy it because God exercised his judgment. So we're going to stop there.